I honestly feel like I'm just screaming into the void at times. So a few days ago, and this story is shared with permission, I had a mid 50 year old patient who was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. So he's got three young kids and this late stage diagnosis should never have happened. We've got robust cancer screening programs that can detect cancer long before it causes any symptoms where we can annihilate it. But so many people don't know these guidelines. And what makes me feel like I'm just screaming into the void is that while people are unaware of these evidence-based screening programs, I see the internet obsessed with trendy, expensive, full-body MRI scans. We're focusing on the wrong things, and today we're going to fix that. So I'll go through the programs that are proven to save lives, so the ones that you actually need to prioritize, and then I'll give you my honest take of the pros and cons of full-body MRI scans. And the conclusion will surprise many of you. Now, the American Cancer Society, they maintain a list of recommendations based on up-to-date evidence with recent important changes that we'll go through shortly about cancer screening programs. Now, these are the ones, again, proven to save lives, and that qualification is essential if we want to lock in the known benefits of cancer screening programs and avoid any public health disasters like the one that happened in South Korea. So in South Korea, the number of people diagnosed with thyroid cancer exploded. So in 1999, there were 6.3 cases per 100,000 people in the population. But by 2009, that number had ballooned to nearly 48. So that's more than seven times as many. And that raises an obvious question. What's going on here that suddenly caused so many extra thyroid cancer cases? Well, after careful examination of the data, researchers had a surprise. It didn't actually look like more people were getting thyroid cancer. Instead, doctors were just finding more cases that had been there all along. But why was this? Well, a government-funded cancer screening initiative had led to widespread uses of ultrasounds to screen for thyroid cancer. But at this point, the story takes an interesting twist, because we'd expect that catching more of these cancers earlier should lead to better outcomes in terms of death rates when it comes to thyroid cancer. But it didn't. Instead, mortality rates in South Korea for thyroid cancer, they've remained about the same. So in other words, we haven't seen better health outcomes related to thyroid cancer in South Korea despite aggressive cancer screening programs that led doctors to catch many of these cases that they used to miss. And consider this chart. It shows the number of patients who'd had surgery for thyroid cancer. So by 2012, that number was around 11,000. But if we look back to 2001, it was only about 1,000 cases. But again, that dramatic increase had no noticeable impact on mortality rates. So these surgeries were not saving lives. Most of them were totally unnecessary. And what's probably happened is that these cancers were so slow growing that they were never going to cause an issue during a person's lifetime. So in those instances, there was no benefit whatsoever. But clearly, there are potential harms with any surgery. Moving on to a second and final example that I want to share about the potential harms of cancer screening programs, I want to have a look at what happened in the UK. So there was a massive study that looked at the impact of screening for ovarian and tubal cancers. So the goal here was to see if catching problems early could save lives. So they used blood tests as well as ultrasounds. But surprisingly, death rates remained the same between the group who were screened compared to the group who weren't. And there were significant numbers of unnecessary surgeries that turned out to be benign non-cancerous growth in the screening groups. So all of this drives home a key point. It seems that it would always be a good idea to screen for cancers, but more information doesn't always mean better health outcomes. Sometimes, and this is a bit counterintuitive, screening can actually be a bad idea. So what the guidelines point us toward are the relatively few cases where we're confident that screening actually does lead to years of healthy life regained when it's used population-wide. So I'll start with three cancer screening programs that are specific to women. So make sure to let your wife or partner know about these screening programs because again, they are proven to save lives. First up is breast cancer. Women should have the option of going for annual mammograms starting at the age of 40, but that becomes a recommendation from the age of 45, and from age 55 and on, the recommendation is for a screening program every two years. Now, there are two important notes here. The first is a common concern online that mammograms cause cancer itself. So mammograms, they do mean radiation exposure, but the amount is very small. And theoretically, that radiation could cause cancer, but an extensive new analysis out of the UK tried to put this into perspective. So regular mammograms are projected to save between 150 to 300 lives for every life lost due to radiation exposure. So the risk of not being screened is vastly greater than the risk from the screening itself. The second note is that the screening might need to start earlier if there's a family history of breast cancer. Next, so this is the second out of three, 
is cervical cancer. So for most women, the guidelines recommend regular screening from about the age of 25 and up until at least the age of 65. So there are a few different methods available here, and depending on the type, this should be done every three to five years. And the last cancer screening program specific to women is for endometrial cancer. And here, it's only some women with a particular medical history who might need to consider a yearly screening. For everyone else, it's important to know the risks and symptoms when they hit menopause. So what about the screenings specific to men? Well, many of my patients assume that regular prostate screening is recommended, but they're surprised to learn that the picture is more nuanced. So rather than a blanket recommendation, the current guidelines suggest a conversation with your doctor. For most of us, this is something to think about, starting at the age of 50, so your doctor can walk through the pros and cons and decide if testing is right for you. This is because the risks of prostate biopsies and operations, they can often outweigh the benefits. So one-fifth, and get this, one-fifth of men will die with prostate cancer, but not from prostate cancer. So this is similar to what we saw in South Korea with thyroid cancers. And this brings me onto the final two cancer screening programs that apply to both men and women. The first is one that patients often dread, screening for colorectal cancers. But this is really important not to ignore because the rates are rising globally, particularly among younger adults. So for most people, regular screening should start at the age of 45 and continue to the age of 75 if we're in good health. And there's a positive change here that many of my patients don't know about. So in the past, Standard screening programs were just with colonoscopies, but with recent years, we've now got highly sensitive tests that can detect signs of colorectal cancer using a simple stool sample, so it's called a FIT test, F-I-T. And personally, I would go a bit beyond these recommendations here, so I plan to do my first stool cancer screening program at the age of 35. But again, that's not something based on research or that I recommend to my patients. For me though, the test is so simple that I don't mind taking this extra precaution. And given that there appears to be a rise in colorectal cancers for younger people, this is just an extra precaution that I want to take. Now finally, there's lung cancer screening, and this is where there's been a recent change in the guidelines. So the previous recommendation was to only get screened if you're between the ages of 50 to 80, and only if you met two additional criteria. So if you'd smoked, and if you'd got at least a 20-pack year history of smoking. But the evidence is mounting that that leaves out a whole bunch of people that would benefit from this cancer screening program. So according to a recent analysis, if we shift those guidelines, we could save potentially 30,000 more lives over a five-year period, and that's just in the United States. So what is the guideline shift here, and how will it affect you? Well, the key group excluded by the American Cancer Society guidelines consists of those who've got a history of smoking but haven't quite reached that 20-pack year threshold. But if we change that recommendation to anyone who's smoked previously, then we could be catching a lot more of these early cancers. But that brings us back to the problem of full-body MRI scans that I mentioned at the start of the video. So again, the promise here is compelling, that we can get a detailed glimpse into our bodies and detect problems before they start to develop symptoms, and where we can treat it easily. Yet the American College of Radiology published a statement recommending against this type of total body screening if we don't have clinical symptoms or clear risk factors. But why is this? Well, partly it's a matter of a lack of evidence. So we currently don't have studies to show that full body scans result in better health outcomes, but they do highlight potential problems. So these full body scans, they can often uncover abnormalities that aren't a health issue, but can trigger additional testing and procedures. And those additional tests and procedures have got their own particular risks, not to mention the expense. So again, remember the South Korea and thyroid cancer debacle that we went through earlier, or the UK and ovarian cancer example. So those cancer screening programs did not save lives. They only resulted in extra tests, biopsies, and operations for no overall benefit. And it's potentially the same here for full body MRIs. So we can get caught up in a cascade of care, but the approach that I take is a bit more nuanced. So there's a critical difference between what makes sense from the perspective of public health compared to the decision-making at the level of individual care. So for public health, it's about risks versus benefit across a wide group. And when it comes to full body MRIs, the math just currently doesn't add up. Before population guidelines are written, we do need solid evidence that full body MRI screening will save lives and that the benefits do outweigh the risks. But when I'm talking things over with a patient, it's a whole different story. So for some people, they are okay with the risks that a scan will find things that wouldn't have otherwise been a problem and may trigger unnecessary procedures. They would prefer to know what's going on in their bodies and then make up their own mind about what to do with that information. They prefer it even though there's no evidence that the scans will save lives. And they prefer it even when I explain to them the surprising example of South Korea or in the UK. But again, on an individual patient level, some people want to know 
and that's absolutely fine. But for others, uncovering findings that aren't actually a problem would only cause anxiety. And given that we don't have direct evidence that the benefits outweigh the risks, for those people, it's better not to get an MRI scan. So this is the difference between public health recommendations and patient-specific recommendations. For me personally, I am okay with that uncertainty. So I do plan on getting a full-body MRI scan. And if it does find something and we're not sure what it represents, I'm happy to know that we've found it and that we'll just monitor it. Overall, that would relax my nerves knowing that we've found something. But again, for many others, that would stress them out and they'd want to know exactly what it is that immediately jump to biopsies, etc., which could cause more harm than good. Returning to the recommended cancer screening programs, though, these are the cases where the data is clear that the benefits vastly outweigh the risks. And if we do follow those guidelines, we've got a much better chance of avoiding the sort of tragic story that I began this video with. But it's not just cancer that we need to worry about. Recently, the guidelines about checking our blood pressure have recently changed. So make sure to check out this next video here to find out if you're aiming for the right blood pressure target.